Thank you, and thank you for being here at our second to last program of 2018. Just so you all know, this is our 55th program of the year. 55th program. Now you understand why I could be tired, and tomorrow I leave for our 56th program of the year, and our final program, which is in Columbia, South Carolina this year, and that will be taking place Saturday afternoon, and we have like 50 or 60 people coming to that program, so they all want to be there for MS Views and News. All right, so next up, I do want to thank the company that gave us the support to do tonight's program. I hope you all appreciate it as well, and that's Genentech, and you'll hear a little bit about Genentech later on. We hope that you appreciate what they did. We cannot do the educational programs that we are doing without the support of the pharmaceutical industry. They actually do want you to learn about everything that we provide at these programs. So we're hoping that you do appreciate what they do and what others do to help us out. Tonight's program is a little bit different. It's called Compass to Care. Okay, Compass to Care is where we're just trying to bring everything together without talking about the specific medications directly, but what involves in your care to do these, to, to live with multiple sclerosis. So our first speaker is Dr. Brian Steingo. And Dr. Steingo is a board certified neurologist who has been practicing in Broward County for over 30 years. He completed his residency at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas, and his practice is limited to treatment of people with multiple sclerosis and related diseases. Dr. Steingo has participated in over 25 clinical trials, including the pivotal trials for natalizumab, fengolimod, dimethyl, fumarate, and alemtuzumab. Very difficult names to even mention, right? He has been actively involved with the National MS Society and was recently awarded by the National MS Society as Health Professional of the Year. Let's thank him for that, all right? And Dr. Steingo is also medical director of MS Views and News and has supported the MS Views and, or MS Views and News organization since we began in 2009. So let's thank Dr. Steingo. Well, thank you, Stuart, and welcome. So many of you have heard me doing programs with Stuart before, and many other programs around Broward and Palm Beach County and Dade County and other places. And this one that, this program over here that Stuart put, asked me to do is a little different from usual. So this is uh, something that I have talked about for a long time. It's called the Land of MS. And basically what this is about is that if you're diagnosed with MS, it's very complex. It involves a lot of things. And so that's what this shows you. This is, if you enter the land of MS, any one of these subjects that you see up there could be the topic that we could spend on a particular night. So we're trying to take some of these. What we can do tonight is try and talk about how you relate all these together for your health care. For example, we're not going to spend a lot of time, but essentially, is that we could take any one of these topics and spend a night. We could, for example, on the top left, it talks to you a little bit about the diagnosis of MS, about the types of MS. On the top right, we talk about how we treat a relapse and the disease-modifying drugs. All of you know, or many of you know, that this is an anniversary year. It's a very important year for MS this year because this year is the 25th anniversary of the first MS drug. Think about that, 1993, the first MS drug, beta serone, was approved, so before that we had nothing. And so think about how many drugs we have. So we could spend, and we do list some of the drugs as we go along, I'll show you something about them, we'll talk a little bit about that, but certainly we could spend all night or all week or we'll have a conference talking about all the disease-modifying drugs. And then in this land of MS, you have the symptom tower. And I label that as the symptom tower because there are so many symptoms of MS, it's a tower. It's a massive tall structure because the symptoms of MS are so widespread, which is why MS is so often over-diagnosed. So whereas years ago MS was under-diagnosed, we have the opposite problem now because there are so many symptoms. If you go onto Google or some search and you type in a few of your symptoms, MS pops up immediately. And then you do a scan and the scan shows something non-specific and someone has a diagnosis of MS and over-diagnosis is a problem. So the symptom tower, full of symptoms, many symptoms that we could spend our evening talking about. And then we're knowing more and more about how important nutrition is and managing your general health. I'll talk a little bit about the health climate and the health bank. And then the importance of research. 
Never should forget the people that research MS that now have given us all these drugs that I'm going to list for you in a little while. And education. That's where we are right now. Right now we're in the Department of Education. That's what Stuart does around the country. All these amazing programs that you can actually read up and look up archives and find out all types of things about, about MS. So these are some of the initial symptoms of MS, which leads in part to why the disease is often overdiagnosed. But you'll see that optic neuritis, eye problems, are a very common early symptom of MS. So in part of this, what Stuart asked me to do, as you see as you go along here, he talks about the healthcare team. And you can see from what these symptoms are, how it leads to what the healthcare team could be. Optic nerve inflammation. Oftentimes, someone with MS, that the first person they're going to see is going to be an ophthalmologist. And later on, maybe follow up with ophthalmologists. Balance problems, dizziness. So you could end up seeing an ear, nose, and throat doctor. You could end up seeing physical therapists. Uh, bladder and bowel problems. You might see a urologist, pain doctors, sensory loss. So these are a list over here of common initial symptoms, which are not specific to MS, but which are seen in many other conditions. And therefore, as I said before, leading to the overdiagnosis of this condition of MS. This summarizes the symptoms that you might have with MS. And that's why I spoke to you about the symptom tower. And that's why MS requires a team of management, because there are so many different things that we could talk to you about. Uh, this also highlights, and we'll talk about them in a little while again, some of the symptoms of MS that we consider to be invisible symptoms, so fatigue, cognitive impairment, symptoms that are not obvious, symptoms that you might feel very bad, yet you look good. To the point where, in fact, the MS Society actually has a booklet, as you know, it's called, But You Look So Good. Because many people with MS look good. In fact, looking around, most people do look good. But I'm sure a lot of people have fatigue and cognitive problems and pain and numbness and tingling and difficulty walking and some of these symptoms. So the symptoms of MS are very widespread. You go and do a Google search, it's going to come up with that diagnosis. And part of the way we diagnose MS at the beginning is to rule out other conditions. So when MS is first diagnosed, we must rule out m some of the many mimics of MS, like lupus, like Lyme disease, like sarcoidosis, and some of these names you might not have heard of, Sjogren's disease. There are a lot of conditions that can mimic MS that we need to rule out at the beginning. And this might also involve other people, like, for example, maybe sending you to a rheumatologist. This would be a common thing that we would want a rheumatologist to help us. So what about treatment of MS? If you don't get treatment for MS, what happens? Well, since 1993, we've had medications. And what we've learned is that it's important to start treatment early for most people. Now, there are some people that will tell you that they haven't had treatment or that they're using some homeopathic treatments and they're doing fine, but these are exceptions. For the most part, we know that we should start treatment early. And if you look at these studies, it will tell you why, that only about 10 to 20% of people have what we call benign MS. If you go back to the early 90s, before we had medications, there were studies done and said, if you have MS, what happens to you? And we know. So this is what happens to you if you don't take treatment. Up to about 20% of people have benign MS. That means that about 10 years after they were diagnosed, you can hardly tell they have MS. They've had minor attacks. Their function is excellent. You examine them and you don't find much. This is what we might call benign MS. You can't always judge this at the beginning. 10 years later, you might say, this looks like a benign type of MS. Only 10 to 20% of people. 5% of people have malignant MS. It's a rapid, rapid MS. The condition declines rapidly. These people are rapidly wheelchair-bound, wheelchair-dependent, or even bed-bound. Uh, this, uh, this type of MS, fortunately, is rare, but, only five, but it is seen in up to 5% of people. So the majority of people, about 75% of people with MS are in, in between, and we know that if we start treatment early, we're going to do something to modify the course of their disease. But if we don't, treatment, don't treat them, from the Mayo Clinic studies and other studies in the early 90s, this is what happens. 15 years after the diagnosis, 15 years, 50% of people have progressed. I want you to think about that. If you remember, the average age of MS onset is about 25 to 45, let's say, and now you're only adding 15 years to that. You're still talking about someone who's young, 25 plus 15, 40. So someone is maybe 40 to 55 years old, and 50% of people have progressed. And 25 years later, 25 years later, 
80% of people have progressed without treatment. So this is on average. On average, if people don't take treatment, 15 years later, 50% have progressed, and 25 years later, 80% have progressed. So this tells us, in general, we're going to recommend treatment. In general, we know it's early. It's important to start treatment early. Now, no drug is a cure. All the drugs modify the disease. Some of them are more powerful than others. But because we are so lucky in this, in this stage now to have so many options, we switch. If one drug doesn't work, it will be time for us to say, what are we waiting for? It might be time to switch. Can we say at the beginning how your MS is going to do? Can we look at you early on and predict what kind of MS you're likely to have? And the answer is we do have some factors that help us predict. So the first one is age at onset. And this refers to the fact that the older someone is, generally the worse. So if you take, for example, someone with their first episode at age 20, compared to, say, a 50-year-old person, the 50-year-old may have a more progressive kind of MS. And then the symptoms at onset. If you have optic teritis, that's a good starting symptom. But if the early symptoms are involvement of the brain stem or the spinal cord, that is generally a worse set of symptoms. So these are things that are helping us now to say we need to treat this disease more aggressively. And then the MRI is important. The more we see on the MRI early on, the more active it is and the more symptoms there and the more and the more sites involved, that is worse. And then how often someone has attacks, how often you have attacks in the first two years and how close they are and how much damage each attack leaves. So in the first two years, if someone's had multiple episodes close to each other and they have some permanent findings already in the first two years, this is a person that we need to go immediately to more aggressive types of medications. And so we calculate all this and we come to risk factors. And then at the end of that, we're going to sit and advise you. And this is part of our program of sitting together and communication, you communicating with your neurologist, going through these things, looking at your scans, looking at your symptoms, and in some way, after that, coming to some kind of conclusion together because it is a healthcare team and all of you are part of the team. So these are our obvious goals of treatment. The most obvious thing we want to do is stop someone from having a relapse. Each relapse potentially could leave permanent damage. So we want to stop relapses. We want to slow down the progression of disability, clearly. And we want to improve the MRI outcome. So when we look at your MRI scan in two years or four years, there's less new spots or active spots. Because each one, each spot, just one spot, can lead to some permanent damage. Of course, we want to prevent morbidity from symptoms. It means we want to reduce your symptoms, reduce the severity of them. We want to maintain adherence. This is part of communication. Encourage someone, tell them to stop their medication. With the injectable medications that we had in the past, the dropout rate was high, very high. Within two years, and I won't ask anyone to guess, but I'll tell you, within two years, 40% of people had dropped out of taking their injectable medications on a regular basis. Even now with the pills, we see some dropout. The only medications we can kind of reliably do things is the infusions because we have a regular schedule. So it make, does make our treatment on a more regular basis. And then we want long-term efficacy and safety. I'll talk a little more about this later with research. We're trying to make sh get new drugs now maybe that are even more effective and have even better safety. Because these are some issues we're dealing with now. We have drugs that are highly effective, but there's some safety issues that we're concerned about. So in the future going forward, we need to find drugs maybe with the same or better effectiveness, but where safety is less of a problem. And this is an amazing slide. This is ready for, for someone who deals with MS, as I have, for as Stuart told you, many years. And some of you here probably have had MS for that long, maybe. 1993 beta serum came out, and these are now all the options that we can give you. Now, some of these are the same. Because one thing that this shows you that's good, if you look on the right-hand side over here in this kind of light yellow color, we now have our first generics. So here's Copaxone initially approved in 1996. Copaxone approved 22 years ago, and now in recent years, we have already two companies making generic Copaxone. So that's our first generics. So initially, all these drugs in yellow were the injectables. The first real infusion drug was Tysabri. 
Before that, this everything in blue here that you see in blue is infusions. Novantron is a chemotherapy drug that was approved years ago. It's toxic, we don't use it. So we had Tysabri approved years ago. And we have two other infusions now. And then we have oral medications. These three oral medications, the oldest one approved in 2010. Now we have three oral medications. So now we have many choices. And if someone is not doing well, if the drug is not effective for them, that is time to change. But there are some other times we change. We could change if the drug, not only if it's not effective, but if you can't tolerate it, that could be a time to change. And there's a third time to change, which could be safety issues. So the reasons to change a medication could be whether safety reasons, efficacy reasons, or effectiveness, and tolerability. Those are the main reasons when we switch you from one drug to another. And these are things that we should be talking about, communicating about all the time at the time of your office visit. So communication, primarily the first person in your, in your team beside yourself is your neurologist to decide whether your medication is working for you. Not only if it's effective, but is it safe? Is it tolerated? And then finally, we have one other miserable component of deciding your medication, the Grinch, the Grinch. What's the big Grinch of MS? Money. Yeah, insurance companies. We could sit down in the office and spend half an hour and pick the right drug for you, and insurance companies say, no, not on your formulary, and we have to spend time fighting them. But that's many medications. So. Now this starts to show you what your healthcare team might look like and other things to think about. Look at all the things we have to think about. So sometimes people will say to me, well, we're trying to pick. We looked at all these drugs and we said, well, there's a lot of medications here. How do we pick what's right for you? Do we throw a dart? Who throws a dart? Who wants to throw a dart? Anybody? No, we don't want to throw a dart. So these are some of the things when you're looking at your medications, you're saying, what are the effects? What are the side effects of these medications? Which of these are acceptable kind of things that we can deal with? So look at some of the things we have to think about. How's your medical health? Does someone have diabetes or heart disease or hypertension? What about the risk of cancer with a medication or the risk of infections? How about skin conditions that some medications can cause? What about the medications you've been on in the past? What about a history of depression or liver problems or kidney problems? It's a complex list. So this is something, when I put you on a medication, that's why I must know, your neurologist must know your history. It's very important that we know everything about you so we can pick the right drug for you. So that's one. I call this a circle of decision. This is one circle of decision making. Look at this. This is another one. This could be all the tests that we're going to do when you start a particular drug. So I might start you on a medication and say, we need to check your eyes. You need to see a cardiologist. We need to check your JC virus antibodies. We need to do MRI scans, see a dermatologist. All these are things that we're going to tell you about that you have to do. These are things you do as part of the team for your follow-up, another circle of decision. And here's another one, the safety of the medications. Some other things to think about, drugs that might affect the eye or slow down the heart rate. Or what about a risk of cancer? How many drugs, when you read about the drug, it says, with this drug, there was an increased risk of skin cancer, or maybe breast cancer, or maybe melanoma. So these are all things we're going to think about and talk about with a circle of decision. Here are some other, finally, things to talk about when you think about the circle of decision. All these important circles are things we're thinking about when we're changing your medication. So if someone says to me, what would you pick? I can't just pick, and I'm not just going to pick. All these things must come into play. I wanted to show you this is a complex decision that we have to make. This is not a simple decision we should make. It should be complex. It should take all these things into consideration. How safe is the drug? What is the efficacy? How effective is it? What's the tolerability of it? How does it affect your lifestyle? What about in a younger patient and childbearing age? What about the effects on pregnancy? And what about if the drug has side effects? What's the exit strategy? Do we have to wash it out? How long do we have to wait before we can start another medication? So these are all important considerations. This over here, if, you, if you're on a medication and at some point you have to switch and you're saying, what things should, should I think about? This is all gonna be on Stuart's on MS Views and News page. As you can see, it's been recorded. So these are things you can look at and say, Let's think about and consider all these things before we 
finally come to a decision. And then you make notes, and you go for your appointment, and you discuss these things. And so that was back to the land of MS. All we've done so far in the land of MS is we've now thought about what drug to put you on. And you see how complex just that decision is, and we've only visited one building in the land of MS. Now this sheet over here that those of you who come to our office fill in, and some of you that see other neurologists, hopefully they give you something similar. This is a very important sheet. This is a, a navigation sheet, and it's to make your visit, to, to, to improve the value of your visit considerably. Stuart has this on his, on his web page, and you can just print it out and fill it in. And this is, this is two pages. It's that page and this page, two pages. And if you fill it in uh, and give it to your neurologist, I can look at this. It takes me just literally a minute. And it immediately sets the tone for the visit if you fill it in properly. It tells me questions you have. It tells me about your medication. So let's look at this. For example, over here, this section over here says, what are your neurological symptoms? You, you, you fill them in the day before. You tell me what they are when you're coming in. I can look at this and immediately know, are these stable, are they new? Because just above that, it's going to say, why are you here today? And you're going to write. You're going to say, I'm here for my annual checkup. Or you're going to say, I'm here because I've got increased fatigue. Or whatever it is. I'm having a relapse. You write down, what are your questions? What are your symptoms? And this most important section, this is the lazy section. This says over here, list all medications. You've all heard me say that 20 times. You're bored. Some of you haven't, though. At least two people here probably haven't heard me say this 15 times. So list all your medications. It's important for me to look at your medications and to see, is there something new? And I saw someone today that hadn't listed the medications, and I said, well, is there anything different? Oh, yeah, three. We found three new medications. Three. What a waste of time. So now what I have to do is I've got your elect electronic medical record in front of me. I have to look at all the drugs, find out about your new drugs, and it's taking time. It's taking valuable time when we should be talking about your symptoms and your disease and your drugs. Write down the medications. Don't write down the same. The same doesn't help me. It doesn't help you, right? If you, have you ever tried to do that with Walgreens? Call them and say, I want the same. <laughs> or unchanged or on file. You think of any others? I told you the best one I've ever had where it says list medications, somebody wrote underneath that, yes. <laughs> yes, I'm on medications, great. I mean, write down what you have. Then underneath that it asks some other questions, not quite as important, but they're helpful. When was your last MRI? Things like that. So now look at this information. I can look at this in 20 seconds. It's already setting a tone for me. Symptoms we might have to talk about. What are your medications? It's already setting the tone. Now that, that whole page might be clear. You might have no new symptoms at all. But look at page two. So page two on top over here asks you some other important questions like about smoking and alcohol. And those might not be the same, but I need to know about those. And then it asks you some very important things about social, psychosocial things, about how's things going in life. Do you need some help? Should we call some organization to help you? Social workers, things like that. Sometimes this is the most important thing on the whole sheet. Now this rates, for example, over here is how's the, how is the quality of your life? How much stress do you have rated from one to five? So if someone puts that their stress is five, which is worse, the worst it can be, five out of five is my stress. And quality of life, one out of five is the worst. If they put that their stress is terrible and their quality of life is one out of five, which basically means it sucks, that means life is tough. And we have to say, is there something I can do to help you? What can I do? Is there something I can do to help you? How can I guide you? Do I need to call a social worker? What do I need to do? Do I need to speak to someone in your family who has no understanding because we see that? What can I do? So it's very important sometimes that psychosocial issues might be our job for that day. So more communication. And again, leading to other members of your healthcare team because I might refer you now to a psychiatrist or a psychologist or a social worker. So I'm now extending our healthcare team. And then this in session, section at the bottom here is a review of systems other systems in your body that could be affected. The particularly important one is your bladder. Bladder involvement is very common and very severe often in MS. 
So I might see this and want to send you to a urologist. But there's others, there's cardiac, there's gastrointestinal, there's respiratory, there's sleep, there's mental health issues over here as well. For example, depression, anxiety, confusion. I might want to send you for a memory evaluation. So all of these things could be very important things. So you fill them in, just check them off, and we look at them. And we might not need to discuss them further, or we might need to spend a lot of time talking about them. So this form over here, this, these two pages, are crucial pages of communication. They enhance the value of your visit. They immediately, within one second, allow your neurologist to process what the tone of our visit is going to be, where we have to go, what our direction is. It's very important to give us direction because this disease is complex. You've seen how complex it is. You've seen that there's a whole land to talk about. So in terms of the symptoms, we could be talking about each one of these, and we could spend time about each one of these symptoms. So let's talk about which one do you want to talk about? Which one would you like to spend the next half hour on? Any one of them. That's why you write them down, because you might say, my main problem that I need to talk about is fatigued. I am so fatigued. I wake up in the morning, I get out of bed, I have breakfast, and I go back to bed. I lie down, I can't work, I'm falling asleep at work. I'm going to be fired. They're going to let me go if you are working. So each one of these problems over here could lead us to the next member of our healthcare team. And never forget the invisible symptoms of MS. I put up this definition of the MS Society and we spoke already about the brochure about you look so good. But it said that people with MS may experience invisible symptoms and they think there's nothing wrong with you. This is not only coworkers. Sometimes coworkers just choose to be ignorant. Sometimes supervisors just choose to be ignorant and look at you and think you can do more and pressure you to do more. And if that's the case, it's not that they choose to be, they are ignorant and they need to be educated. But this is hardest when it's family members that look at you and think that you're lazy. Lazy. Do something. It's in your head. Yeah? What it is, isn't it? There's scars. You have to educate them. And this is a good warning sign for me. When I see people that come and see me and they have problems, invisible problems like fatigue, and family members are not understanding, and the family members do not show up with them at visit after visit, I know that there's some problem in this family. And it's not going to have a happy ending usually. So this invisible symptom of invisible symptoms are very important symptoms. Here I listed some of them. Fatigue, pain is invisible. There was a time they used to say MS doesn't cause pain. I don't know if many of you have had that, been had MS that long, but they said MS doesn't cause pain. But it can cause pain, nerve pain, muscle pain. There are different kinds of pains that can happen with MS. And of course, the cognitive problems, the memory problems, that on the surface, somebody can cover up for those. They may not always be obvious. But we spoke earlier about this disease and the ages that it happens. And guess what the most disabling symptom is in terms of work? In a young MS patient, most MS patients that stop working at a young age is because of cognitive problems. Because you can deal with some physical problems and you can cope with some physical problems. You can walk. I have many patients who are in wheelchairs and have a special van and drive to work. But there is no such adjustment for cognitive problems. If there is a loss of memory, confusion, there is no way that somebody can escape from that. So these invisible problems of MS are very, very crucial problems. This long list over here, let's go back, is what I call the primary symptoms of MS. These are directly due to the scars that are on your brain and your spinal cord and your optic nerves. Those are the three components of the central nervous system, brain, spinal cord, and optic nerves. And directly as a result of that, you have this long list of symptoms. But now we have some other symptoms that are very important. These are the secondary symptoms of MS never to be forgotten. Because of that first set of symptoms, this is what happens. You have a loss of balance and weakness, and you might fall and have injuries, head injuries, broken bones. Your kidneys don't work. You get urinary tract infections, lung infections, anxiety and depression, and inability to do activities of daily living independently, needing some help. These are the secondary symptoms of MS, which are equally important. And then, finally, this 
set of symptoms, the tertiary symptoms. Because of everything else that's gone before this, what happens? There is loss of work. Remember, this is a disease we said before, people in peak earning years, 20 to 45 or 50, starting families, young children, and you can't work. It's a massive, massive th disruption of the family, divorce, social isolation, loss of independence, loss of self-esteem. And these are all things that we have ways of attempting to help people. There are people that do respond to this help and there are those who don't. But there are ways of doing this. And this is very important. There are books to read. There are social workers to assist us. There are things that we can do for this. This is difficult. The deeper you get into the problems, the more difficult it is to deal with them. But there are ways of dealing with them. So it's important for us to know about all these things. If we don't know about them, we can't help you. So communicate. So I can help you. I can refer you to the right people. Because every day I see this. I see these every day. And I can refer you. I can't deal with all these. Uh, I'm not an expert on financial matters. How do, when you can't work and there's financial stress and there's family problems. This is one I've been to court for several times. Divorce, not myself. Um, but I've been to court several times where there's been suits for divorce. That, for example, there's a divorce going on, and usually in divorces, in most cases, men are the worst creatures than women. And so I had one recently where this particular lady had not worked for 20 years. And her husband, who had a very successful business worth like $10 million, decided she could go back to work after 20 years. So, of course, we had to go to court with that one. Unfortunately, the judge sided with me and with her, and, and the husband had to pay up. But I've seen quite a few of those. So, social isolation, people saying friends have left them. And I'm saying if they left you, they're not your friends. Find new friends. There are some nice people out there. If you watch the news at 7 o'clock at night or 9 o'clock or 10 o'clock, you don't think there's many nice people. So, I don't know, but there are some. So, these are just all important things that we need to think about. And this leads us to other parts of our team. Psychiatrists, social workers, psychologists, and other family members. So here's part of the team. Now you can probably tell me other people to add on. So you're a neurologist or nurse practitioner. Many nurse practitioners are very well trained. And, and, uh, and um, your primary care doctor, it's good to have a primary care doctor in our team who is understanding. Sometimes they're on, sometimes they aren't. People sometimes say to me, can I refer them to a primary care doctor who knows about MS? And I said, no, there is no such thing. I don't want him to know about, or her to know about MS. I want them just to be open-minded and work with us. So that if I say, I want you to get a particular test, we can get it. If I think you need some lab work or your urine check, they help us with it. And they don't get in our way. That's what we want, because they don't have to know about MS. That's my job. Their job is to help us take care of you. So that's the kind of primary care doctor that you want. And then these are the other people you might see, an ophthalmologist, a urologist, a pain management doctor, the psychiatrist, the psychologist, the physical therapist, the trainer, the nutritionist, the social worker. Because we know that all these things are important for you in MS. You're going to hear more later from Jeff about the importance of exercise so, and diet. You all know I could talk about diet all night. So now what about treating your symptoms? We've spoken about all these people that are part of your healthcare team. Look at some of the symptoms that we ha may have to treat. What is, look at this list. There are some, the dog is giving me a message here. <laughs> hey doggy. Look at this list. Some people could be on a whole, some people seem to like medications. And so we need to listen and try and treat your symptoms in ways, not always by giving you a medication. There might be other ways of helping symptoms sometimes. We shouldn't respond automatically every time with the medication. But sometimes we need to, and some people are on a whole long list of medications, and some need less. But look at this list. If we treated just some of these symptoms, look on the right-hand side at all these medications. Let me just quickly say this. If you had fatigue, depression, and spasticity, common MS symptoms, pain, bladder problems, cognitive problems, tremors, walking problems, just some of these symptoms. There are medications that we could do for all of them. We don't want to. We're trying to avoid medications. What's the problem if we have all these medications? So you might be seeing five different doctors. You might see me, you might see a urologist, you might see a psychiatrist, and then on top of that, maybe you're diabetic, and you've got high blood pressure, and you're seeing your family doctor, and they're putting you on medications. What's the result of this? You're on a whole bunch of medications. We need to make sure that how their interactions are. 
very important. So that leads us to what, this is the topic of what we call polypharmacy. It's because you're on medications for treating your MS, your MS drug, your MS symptoms, and other conditions. That leads to what we call this topic, very important subject of polypharmacy, and how often do we know that people have interactions because people may have multiple chronic diseases managed by multiple people, and they might have multiple pharmacies involved. And then formularies change over time. Sometimes they just change your medications, and they don't even warn you about it. And the volume of medications. There's a great increase in the number of medications that people can use. And then the type and the dose of medication may change. The MS population is aging. We have older patients with MS now who have other medical diseases. And so we need to look at and adjust the medications. And then most importantly at the bottom here, monitoring and follow-up. Be part of the team. Make regular visits. I mean, you take your car in for a service usually, at least most people do. Take yourself in for a service. Make sure that you have routine visits to evaluate everything. How am I doing? And so we go back again to the land of MS. We spoke about communication with your primary care physician, which is your neurologist generally, or nurse practitioner. And then all the other physicians and other services and other people that could be involved. So this is all part of this thing that we want you to be part of this. Let's not forget about research. So research is very important. All these medications we've spoken about would never have happened if there were not clinical trials. And so to me, some of the heroes in MS are people that were in clinical trials. Now, clinical trials have changed a little bit in MS because if you go back 20 years ago, there were no options, there were no drugs. So when we did a clinical trial, we would compare a medication to a placebo. But nowadays, if we're putting someone in a trial for a relapsing type of MS, and there's so many drugs out there, we can't compare it to placebo. We have to use an active drug to compare it to. But this is part of research. We, find we want to improve these drugs for relapsing MS, improve their safety, and improve their effectiveness. So this is one area of research. We have an area of research over here on the left. We want to improve the protection of the nervous system. We call that neuroprotection. We want to give you drugs that protect your cells so there's less injury and death to cells. We want medications maybe that will even allow myelin to regrow. And look at this, Biogen has a, a drug in study called Antilingo. It's in study, but we're hopeful that this might actually promote regrowth of myelin. That could be something in the future. And then on the right-hand side, we want more drugs for secondary or primary progressive MS. We just have our first drug for primary progressive MS approved only 18 months ago. And according to the FDA, if you stick by the books, there are right now, there is only one drug approved by the FDA for secondary progressive. It's poison, it's, it's no Vantron, it's chemotherapy. So we have many places that we need to go over here. If you look over here, this says biomarkers. Biomarkers are substances in the blood that can help us predict maybe what kind of MS do you have? What kind of drugs are you gonna to respond to? How is your MS gonna do? These are things we're looking for also in research. Um, we're doing a study in this group here, looking just to give you an example of some research and efficacy and safety, is the drug Tysabri that's been around for a long time. It's an old drug. It's an excellent medication, but it has one serious side effect, which is called PML, which is a virus disease of the brain. And we can predict to some degree the risk of that by measuring JC virus, by measuring a certain virus in your blood. And so the study we're doing now is we're taking this Tysabri and instead of giving it every four weeks, as is approved by the FDA, we're giving it to some people every six weeks because in some preliminary studies that does seem to reduce the risk of PML and maybe not reduce the effectiveness. So that's the study that's going on. And then we have a drug for a secondary type of progressive type of MS that's called Siponamod. This is another drug that we're able to study now in, in our group. So there are some new things, new avenues we're looking at with uh, research. Of course, a very important member of the team that we haven't spent a lot of time talking about. We've spoken about all the different medical people involved and physical therapists and psychologists and psychiatrists and everybody like that, but yourself, what you do for yourself. That's why I called it self-power. And I made this little acronym 
of teams of friends. And these are all things that you have some role in doing. And I just, this is not in any order of importance. It's just only words that I could think of to make this into a group of words of teams of friends. Things you manage yourself, temperature, exercise, adherence, taking your medication, mental aspects, keeping yourself mentally involved, the importance of sleep, and other S words, smoking. Smoking is very important. Smoking causes a decline in MS. Smoking increases the risk of MS becoming progressive. Organization. There have been people who have actually written about that, about MS patients having disorganization, being cluttered. Imagine that somebody actually studied that, about clutter in MS. How many people here are cluttered? No, don't have to answer. But I mean, yes, people are cluttered, and it causes disorganization and confusion. And fatigue, the importance of fatigue, that when you have fatigue, we interrogate you and say, why are you fatigued? If you say you're fatigued, then I give you provision and say, go home. That's not right. That's not right. What I have to say is, why are you fatigued? Maybe it's because you're not sleeping. Maybe it's because you're depressed. Maybe some medication is making you fatigued. We must interrogate and investigate other causes. And then F stood for food and faith, uh, nutritional. Uh, N is news and nutrition, relationships, interactions, exercise, safe. I mean, there's a whole long list of these things that I made in from this acronym, Teams of Friends. If anybody can take those letters or add anything or do anything and show them to me, I'm always happy to look at them. But these are things that you power yourself. You're constantly doing self-power. Every day you're doing self-power. Every day you're thinking about these things, I hope. Exercise. Safety. That I'm going somewhere, I'm exercise, I'm walking and I need to be safe. I need to pay attention. No multitasking. Like, uh, let's see. Oh, whoop. No multitasking. Texting and driving are bad. And you see it all the time on the road, don't you? Yeah. Walking and texting are just as bad because you could fall. So the major risks from this disease are infections, urinary tract infections in people that have bladder problems and falling and getting head injuries. And I've lost more patients from those two things, infections and sepsis and head injuries and blood clots on the brain than anything else. But pay attention, pay attention. Think about these things all the time. Walking, doing exercise, eating properly, paying attention if you have symptoms uh, to, so what you do yourself, being part of this team, very, very important. And so in the land of MS, the goal is wellness. It's kind of a cliche and it's a corny thing these days. Uh, the goal is wellness. And so I have these things that I put up there called the climate. Obviously, wherever you live, you like to have a good climate. So from all the things we've spoken about already, the good climate is the support around you. That's your healthcare team. That's your friends, your relationships. This is the climate that you surround yourself with. And if you have toxic things in your climate, if there's smog around us and, and there's a bad climate, we're going to try and get out of it. And if you're living in an area where there's some toxic relationships or, or your relationship with your physician or healthcare team is toxic, change it. The climate is very important. And the next one is the health bank. Hopefully in working years or at any other time, you're trying to save some money that you put in the bank account that you can have for the future. Well, guess what? Your bank health bank is just as important. Put the money in your bank when you can. Exercise, nutrition. Every time you do the right kind of exercise and eat healthy, you put money into your health bank. Very important, because you're saving. What do we know about the MS population? It's aging. It's aging. Look around us. I mean, MS starts at the age of 20 to 40. How many people here are 20 to 40? So the MS population is aging. In fact, the MS Society, hi. In fact, the MS Society put, a, put out, has this, as you know, this magazine called Momentum, and they had an issue which you could probably find in the archives on MS and aging. So it's very important as people age, Things happen to your body. And how do you slow those down? By doing all the things we spoke about before, the correct nutrition, exercise, those same things apply. So that all applies to wellness. And then the self-help toolkit I'm not going to discuss today, but that's all the things you do for yourself. That was just part of a whole discussion, and it applies to all the things on this page. And so I think I'm going to leave, have this as the last one which is again with this goal of wellness and what we try to tell you about is shared decision making between you 
and all the other people on your healthcare team, and then all the other people in all your other relationships, and to result in good physical, these are stresses that we face in life. Now, I put the fourth one at the bottom there because it is a real stress, but it's not part of the health stress. Part of the health stress that we face every day is physical, emotional, and nutritional. These are stresses that we face that we must deal with, and by going through all the steps that I spoke to you about, we have different ways of dealing with them, and ultimately, if we can deal with those, we can try and mitigate the financial uh, stresses that happen. So that kind of concludes what uh, Stuart has allowed me to speak over here. Um, so, uh, thank you very thank much, you, Dr. Stuart. Steingo. Okay. Everybody say thank you, Dr. Steingo. Now what we're going to do is we're going to run around the room. I'm going to run around the room, and I'm going to take your questions. So whoever has a question, please raise your hand and just get me to acknowledge that you have a question, and I'll get to you shortly thereafter. Who wants to begin? All the way in the back, of course. Whoever's next, raise your hand so I know where to go to. Dr. Steingo, how do you um, describe going about getting your healthcare team all on the same page? Do you, we set up like an email or do we, we as a patient have to call each doctor and say, our neurologist wants this, our cardiologist wants this? How do we get everybody on the same page with our health? So, Obviously, the one thing, let's go, let me do something over here. Um, how do we get to the first slide? Well, let me go, let me just do it this way. Okay. So you'll see that on this over here, on this slide, I put at the bottom here the self power tower. This is a huge part. The self power tower, and what I call the control tower, is the way you do that. So if you have MS, obviously, and that's your primary disease, your neurologist is your, you know, your, your main doctor for your disease. But like I told you before, your primary care doctor is very important. So what you want to do is stress to your doctors to have communication. So these days we have electronic records. Now if we're all part of the same organization, then that's very easy. For example, if you in our office, I'm part of Tenet Healthcare. If there's other Tenet doctors, everything I do is on the same page. They can see that. But if they're not, you simply have to ask your doctors. The best way to do is ask them to, to fax each other or send reports to each other. That said, it's easier said than done because constantly, every day, someone comes to see me and says, I say, when did you last have your, your lab? They say, last week, and the doctor said they'll send it and it's not there. Again, like we spoke about before, another waste of time. So be part of the healthcare team. If, uh, you know, try and ask your doctors to fax to each other. Um, try and have whatever lab, whatever information you bring with you is fine. If you have scans, when you leave a scan center, leave the scan center with a disc in your hand. So when you come and see me or your neurologist, we have the disc so we can look at it. So I think in a perfect world, everybody would just send notes to each other. But I think your role is just to ask the people to send notes to each other and bring with whatever you can. If you're on a system like Quest, for example, and Quest has lab, uh, when you check into the office, you can ask them, do you have my lab? And if they don't, then you can look it up. Show me when you come into the office, print it out. So it's not perfect, but you, you should be part of this. You should help us with this as well. Ideally, if you ask physicians to send notes, so if you tell me, for example, can you send a note to my uh, you know, primary care doctor, Dr. Smith, it's very easy. Because it's electronic. It's an electronic record. By the time you leave the office, my record is pretty much complete. And all I have to do is tell my medical assistant to send the note to Dr. Smith, here's his fax number. So everybody should just do it like that. So you're right, it's not a perfect world by any means, but I think you just have to be part of that and you have to be an activist for yourself and speak to the different people involved and say, please send notes. And if they repeatedly don't send notes and don't answer your questions and, and don't talk to you when you call, I mean, I've had people that come and see me and say, you know, I've called, I've been calling this person for a month and they never reply. Well, then you need somebody else. You need somebody who's responsive. Next question's here. Do you consider the generic drugs absolutely comparable to the brand drugs? Is there any advantage to taking a, the a brand drugs over the of the a generic? I mean, from the standpoint of the of MS itself, right now, the only generic we have is Copaxone. Uh, there are two companies, Sandoz and Mylan, that are making generic Copaxone. Uh, initially, when it first came out, we started. We were fighting with insurance companies. 
I drafted some long emotional letter to them about, you know, someone's been on Copaxone for X number of years, and, uh, you know, it's not, not ethical uh, or professional to change the drug, and they don't care. They said they've got to try the generic first. That said, since we've been using, the, since patients have switched, probably we've had about 50 or 100, maybe something like that, people switch to the generic Copaxone. We've had very little problems. Most people have done fine with it. Uh, so we've really not had problems really with that drug. The other drug that's just become generic is Ampira, which some of you might be taking for walking. Uh, Ampira has now become generic. It's the same thing, we're having the same thing. We try to write some letters, they don't care. They just say you have to try the generic first. So far those drugs seem to be okay. Question for you, going along the line of generics, a lot of people want to know if they're really saving money by using them. Saving money? Yeah. Well, sometimes the insurance company will say, if you take a generic, your copay is $20. If you take the brand name, it's $500. So yes, sometimes, and some drugs you do. We looked up today, it's not always a huge saving. I looked up today with the patient who's taking Ampira, and the copay, her copay for one month with Ampira was like $430. So we looked it up, and we said, okay, let's look up GoodRx. I don't know if you're all familiar with the site called GoodRx. GoodRx has many drugs at very good prices like Provigil and some other drugs. But we looked up Ampere on GoodRx uh, and looked up the generic and the saving was only about $120. So usually there is a, sa a saving, but I think you just have to look around. It's, it's variable, the amount of saving is variable. Great, thank you. How do you determine what, especially with people aging, what's actually MS and what's just age? You know, like arthritis or what's um, an MS? You can't, uh, you can't always. There's some overlap. Essentially, all of us are aging, and when you age, there is some your your reserve is lower. There's been some damage to your nervous system. There's some scarring and some damage to your nervous system. And a secondary to that, I showed you secondary symptoms. If you don't walk properly uh, uh, because of your MS, that puts more stress on joints, back, knees, hips, other joints, which may accelerate arthritis. So there's definitely overlap. And so it's just by evaluating an individual because everybody's different. So it's a personalized thing. There's, you can't generalize for a whole group. Every person would be different. And then at the end of the day, the treatment might be the same. So as you see, when you see older people walking, uh, they have a particular posture of the way they walk. And a lot of that is because they don't exercise. They don't stretch. Their muscles in their legs are tight. It makes them hunch over. Uh, it causes all kinds of changes. So we have to overlap now between your MS problem and your aging problem, and we just treat for both of them. We evaluate for both of them. Now, sometimes it might be a disease of aging. So we just have to be alert to this. I think I would have to say to you it's a personalized thing. We would look at a person and say, well, let's see your symptoms and uh, stress them more. You know, the, the greater importance of paying attention to nutrition, uh, body mechanics, exercise, those things. Next question here. Oh, okay. <laughs> one germ, okay. Thank you, Dr. Steingo, for doing this. But uh, one of the questions I have has to do with nutrition, the importance of nutrition. Now, for MS, is it better to be high-protein, low-carb, non-GMO, organic? <clears throat> Excuse me, losing my voice. But um, what are the recommendations nutritionally for MS? So... <laughs> It's, again, what you're gonna have is different, so what I'm gonna give you is my recommendation. But you could have a neurologist standing up here who might give you some different recommendations. There are some studies that have been looked at nutrition with MS. Uh, there are studies, there are people also say that all you have to do is eat a basic healthy diet. So what I'm saying to my patients for the most part is I'm recommending to you to eat a healthy diet, the same as you would if you have cardiovascular disease, diabetes, hypertension, other chronic diseases. It's the same kind of thing that I recommend. This is what I recommend. What I'm putting, proposing to you now is what I recommend, which is that people could, for example, look at a Mediterranean-type diet. And what I recommend to people is avoid red meat and avoid dairy, or minimize those. If you have a steak once a month, if you like it, that's fine. But avoid red meat and avoid dairy. Have a diet that is a plant-based diet. So essentially what I'm saying is that our diet should be a plant-based diet. These days there are amazing options that you can get, uh, and amazing things you can do, and amazing places you can research, like Google and other places, as to what to do with the plants. So essentially what I'm saying is a plant-based diet. There are vegan diets for MS. 
There's a diet called the McDougal diet. The original MS diet that you probably all know of is called the Swank diet. Dr. Swank wrote the very first diet for MS about 50, 60 years ago. Uh, his diet initially in the first year said avoid saturated fats. So what I'm saying is avoid red meat, avoid dairy, avoid saturated fats, avoid salt, and avoid sugar. These are the primary things that I put forward that I would like people to follow. Before I get to the next question, sorry. Um, you know, we're video recording, so whatever you need to do as far as taking notes, you don't need to take notes. You'll get to see this in a couple of weeks as soon as we publish it, okay? Uh, my question is between disease modified, the good DMT, if you take glatiramat, which is the old medication, is have any protection, at least uh, some kind, uh, if the person is not taking a good quality DMT? If it should be good to take at least that? Yeah, I mean, all, all of these drugs that we have here, if I got your question right, all of the drugs have some effectiveness. Uh, Glatiram acetate, Copaxone is old, one of our older medications. It's 22 years old now, approved in 1996. And it does have some effectiveness. That's why it's still a very commonly used drug. And it's still got some advantages. Safety-wise, it's got advantages. Um, and it does have some, there are some studies that have suggested it has some neuroprotective benefit. So yes, if, 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 if this is a drug that we could select for you because of your concerns about, say, safety issues or other concerns, it's still, I would still consider it to be an effective medication. Thank you, doctor. Doctor, um, exercises. Um, I've been doing a lot of exercises, and recently I tried to do little or not doing as much as I was doing before. And I, I'm seeing the weaknesses actually coming back, where I'm actually losing my balance more than before. Um, you're you're going to hear from an exercise expert very soon, somewhere there, right, Jeff? Mm -hmm. He's going to talk to you about exercise. All I can tell you is that I put up in that one slide you, you saw over here, um, this last one that I put up, this one, about the stresses that, that our bodies face every day, including physical stresses and the importance of exercise. But the most important thing for exercise is that it should be personalized for you. Just like I've talked about other things that you personalize for yourself. We need to find the right exercises for you. And so I would recommend for most people when they start out, see a physical therapist, see a trainer, see somebody who can evaluate you, your weaknesses, your strengths, and then teach you what you should do. I think that's the most important thing. For exercise to succeed, it must be exercise that you like to do. You probably, if I told you what I do, you'd say I'm nuts, for example. You might, or you might say you like it, I don't know. But you need to do exercise that you like for it to succeed. And that applies to everything, actually. It applies to your diet, the same thing with the diet. When you ask me about diet, you have to find the foods that, within this parameter that I'm telling you about of having a plant-based diet, you need to do research. There might be some plants you like more or less than others. So the same with exercise. There might be some exercises that are too exhausting for you. Uh, you have to be in the right environment. Make sure it's air conditioned. It's not too hot. So there are many things that have to be set in place for the exercise to be successful. So if you're wondering about what to do and you're not sure, I would always say start out with a physical therapist or a trainer, somebody who can evaluate you and give you guidelines, and then that must become part of your lifestyle. Thank you. We have time for two more questions. One of them is here. Hopefully we'll get a hand for the next one. Thank you, Dr. Sango. I was wondering um, what the rate of newly diagnosable MS patients are, whether it's more or less the same, whether it's increased or decreased. Yeah, so it seems that there if you go back and compare it to the past, it does appear to be an increased number of people with MS, especially in females. We don't know why that is. For example, if you go to many programs and they put up the number of people with MS, they say 400,000 people with MS. We think it's double that. Maybe even close to a million people in the US with MS. They normally throw out 400,000. It's probably much more than that. Some people have very mild MS, but it's probably more than that and we think, and the incidence of MS has increased over the years especially in females, it has increased, but it is increasing. And some people say, well, is that because we can diagnose it better? Because we do have better ways of diagnosing it, MRI scans, which we've had for about 30 years now. Before that, it was much harder to diagnose. 
so we can diagnose it better, but that said, even, even, even beside that, there does seem to be an increase in the instance of MS. Are there any other questions? Then that will be the last question. Thank you, Dr. Steingo. Thank you.